this is an interesting conversation for me because I come from the part of the world that I heard a number of people saying IT is hard to understand and that's my world. Um, so I come from the IT background and we also do application development services and enablement for companies that are putting IoT products in the field. So, um, so these are some examples of, of projects that we've done and I just realized something moved around. Um, but Caterpillar, Amway and their air filtration system, rail cars. So people lose rail cars all the time. Um, hard to believe because they're kind of confined to a track, but people lose rail cars on a fairly regular basis. And so we're working with Amstead Rail on a tracking system that is real time across the entire rail system in, in North America for keeping track of where railway cars are. And it's embedded in the, in the uh, track bed of the, uh, of the car. Um, Navistar industrial trucks. There are 372,000 heavy trucks on the road right now that are connected that are IoT devices. Um, and that there's some interesting things that happen there and even furniture in the build space. And so we're, we've worked with construction companies and, and companies that make things and made them IoT and connected devices. And what we saw as we work in these different spaces is that the challenge is almost always the same no matter the size of the company, uh, Caterpillar, Fortune 100 global company, and the things that they're struggling with is the same as the, um, as the construction company in my hometown of Grand Rapids, Michigan, who's trying to build a control infrastructure for a, a, a design, build, manage model for their construction. And so we've said that the IoT has two goals, digital transformation, means that we are building a digital product and an organizational competency at the same time. So what's the organizational competency that we're building? And because we saw these struggles consistently, we have actually collaborated now with uh, Stanford University, the Graduate School of Business, and Rob Siegel and I um, have worked together on a number of projects now, and Rob teaches a class called the Industrialist Dilemma at Stanford. And this class focuses on the challenge that industrial companies have, traditional old school companies that have been around forever, and the challenges they have in, in facing digital transformation and, di and digital innovation. And the dilemma is described because of a set of industry trends that we're facing, which we've talked about already this morning. Ubiquitous smartphones, data storage, connectivity, low cost contract manufacturing, it's easier to build things now than ever has been before, and software and the software becomes the differentiation. Um, and the impact isn't on the technology company, it's on the incumbent company in the industry. So you think about Uber and the taxi companies, you think about Airbnb and the hotel companies, you think about um, Apple and the music industry, you can pick any number of industries where a digital innovator came into the space and completely broke the old economic model. And, and so um, there are, there are um, opportunities and challenges that come up from that and the advantage that the disruptors have is that they don't have any legacy organizational baggage. They have no we've always done it um, conversations and little regulation. Think about how Uber enters into a market. They weren't sure if it, what they were doing was legal or not. They really weren't. Um, Airbnb wasn't sure if what they were doing was legal but they knew that there wasn't a law explicitly forbidding what they were doing so they were willing to enter into the space and try. And they all, almost always have great software talent. And that then competes with the incumbent. And this is, a, this is a fantastic illustration, I think, of the differences because in the traditional companies, it was all about owning assets and the new companies renting. Um, so we moved from a different economic model analog products to digital products. That's what we've been talking about today as well. The direct relationship with a consumer um, and the idea that because of what you carry in your pocket, um, the manufacturer, the building owner, now has a direct relationship with their consumer. And as a result, I can learn and understand and the consumer has now, a, I, I can learn things directly from the consumer and how they interact with the space. So Herman Miller, for example, 
um, they've always made furniture. They make great chairs, they make great desks, they make lots of things. And now we've put sensors in the chairs and the desks. So now we can identify occupancy information directly from how many people are, have butts in the chair through the day and how many chairs and desks do we actually have to have in a, in a space to provide occupancy information. And so we have the sensor. And because it's a standing, sitting desk, they, when the, when the t phone is put on the desk, the phone actually communicates to the desk and says, oh, what's this person's preference for how high the desk should be? And the desk moves up. When they sit down in the chair, the chair knows, oh, someone just sat down in me. I'm going to move, the, I'm going to move down. And, and the phone communicates to the desk, and the desk knows where it is physically. And so that then informs everyone else who's in that workspace that this person who's doing desk hoteling is sitting at this space. And so if I need to find Jim, this is where you can go find them. So now, the interaction and the personalization that occurs, and I think that's one of the interesting key points of this, is that personalization, because of that direct relationship to, to the consumer, results in a different kind of experience. And it also disintermediates the historic channel. Because the manufacturer has direct relationship with the consumer, the people who've normally been between those relationships maybe know less about the people than, the, than some of the people in the manufacturing space. I've mentioned regulatory apathy. How about this one? What's happened to our product cycles? Um, furniture, trucks, air filtration systems. Um, one of our projects, um, and I can, I can say that here, is we helped Johnson Controls build their um, ch uh, energy management system that's connected for their connected chiller platform. Um, they were used to um, product cycles that were based on traditional chiller manufacturing cycles. Now we just put a digital front end on it. How often are we updating the firmware on that digital front end? It's a very different product cycle than what they were used to. And, and so the product update frequency, and that throw, if you want to make an engineer crazy, tell them that you're shipping something that's incomplete, that might, the very first thing you do when you put it in the field is you're going to do a, a firmware upgrade to it. That drives people crazy. But that's one of the changes that we have because we're dealing with software. How about this one? IT is a cost center. And now IT is a revenue generator. Yeah. Um, it's not about, and, and this is really hard for IT. I've got, I've got CIOs and IT managers that have lost their jobs over this one. They've gotten fired because they were managing the old way, cost and reliability, reducing risk. And what happens when you try to do cost and reliability and reduce risk? You slow things down. And then all of a sudden you're a revenue generator and IT managers get fired over that now because they can't keep up. But as if we, we think about digital disruption and digital transformation, you have to shift your idea of what the IT team is doing. And we move from a hierarchical model to being more decentralized because we have different access to information. And we move from efficiency to being more responsive to our consumers. And so this is the crux of the digital transformation story. And this is consistent across 150 person companies to companies that are in the hundreds of thousands. So that, yeah. Um, this is uh, from the class notes uh, that Rob Siegel uses in his graduate class at Stanford. So I, will, I can distribute this, this particular one. There was also a Harvard Business Review article in October or November of last year, um, which I'll have cited later in the project as well. So th this is a, and, and, and so what we've done is we actually bring, um, we've brought Rob into our, into our projects because in our big organizations like Caterpillar, they need to hear this message. I'll differ with, with the gentleman from Intel this morning. He was talking about IoT drives connections between things. For us, IoT is driven by a direct relationship with the thing or the user of the thing. The ability to connect the previously unconnected, not just devices, but also the aspects of life. We never 
you know, uh, when we put in smart thermostats, we start getting sensitivity into environmental inf information we never had before. When we put sensors in places, when we put mobile apps and have people interacting. How many of you have ever heard of the Comfy app? Any of you hear about that? Okay. So the Comfy app is a crowdsourcing uh, thermostat. You can actually load the app and then say, how comfortable are you? Are you warm or cold? And it provides real-time information to the building owner that says, the people in this area are warm or cold. God help the man who is the one male employee at a department of women <laughs> in this model, not to be sexist, but we actually did a prototype with that and it was just interesting to see the variation in perception of temperature, right? And, and so this idea that you'd personalize your space to that degree and get insight from that is really interesting. But we stop having a, just a selling transactional relationship with our customers in this moment to having what I call a symbiotic relationship with our customers because we move from that transaction to now I am going to be involved with you for a long time. I'm going to be providing managed services. I'm going to be using the data. And this is the drawing we use to highlight that. And that is that in the space, you think about this pattern of interaction and uh, let's do this. And in this pattern of interaction, you've got a person who's using a, an app. The app is communicating to the piece of equipment, and this is going on right here. That's then sending data to the cloud, right? And then the cloud data is combined with everybody else in the world. This is what Johnson Controls does. And then that feeds the data into an analytics environment, which is combined with serial number data, service history, work orders, service um, you know, inventory, bill material, so on and so forth. And then we build machine models. So here's the interesting thing that happened at JCI. Bearing kits and chillers, the most expensive part in the whole chiller. We now have predictive models to be able to say when the thing's going to break before it breaks. So, so for certain models of chillers, that, that particular, I mean, you guys know how much those parts cost. Um, they were able to get a 13% reduction in their, in their inventory management costs because they were shipping the part to customer. Now they ship the part to a customer. They replace it on a schedule. It's not based on hours of operation. It's based upon when the thing is going to break because we can identify a vibration frequency change in the device before the bearing fails. And I, I, I went out on a service call with a person from JCI who was in this space. And you all, you all know the guy who's like this, right? Who can put his hand on the chiller and he knows that something's wrong with it. It's, it's the guy who's been in the field for 30 years and he can, he can tell. He can tell that something's wrong. And what we did is we, we took that, I can tell something's wrong, and we looked at the math to see what frequency variation and what sensor data was being identified as an, and when, when something failed in the field, what was the first variation that we saw in the math that would show that this was gonna break? So now we have a predictive model. And this is what is happening in the space because what's happening is based on the data, we create a service optimization which then provides more value to the user. In a digital transformation mindset, you're not just selling a transaction, you're building a relationship with a customer from which you can get data. That's the whole point of IoT. I can get data, and then from that data, I can create a new service opportunity from you. Be really, really thoughtful about data ownership and stewardship and, 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 and who has that, because there are people that are, that are building entire business is based upon access to data now. And that's a huge, huge opportunity. They're not just using it to, to, ch to get access to new economic models, but they're also using it to create new products and services. So our team, our, our design team had a chance to be involved and we were one of the developers of the Nest 3.0 thermostat. Um, think about the experience change across this continuum. This one's driven by user experience and by data. 
and you guys know what the other ones do. One controls a temperature, programmable, I, and even in this crowd, how many of you actually programmed your programmable thermostat back in the day? Okay, a couple? Right, how many of your customers did? <laughs> Terrible user interface, right? Compared to what the Nest has, or the new Honeywell thermostats have. And so from the data, we now create better user experiences. And that gets to our twofold mindset. We've historically focused on optimization, managing risk, safety, maximizing assets, and efficiency, and decreasing cost. We've entirely focused on this side of the world. But when we are gathering data to do this, we also create, opportun create opportunities for net new things to, to supply to your customer. So fundamental to this idea of digital transformation is that I am taking what I learn as I optimize environments and I'm thinking about how I create new opportunity and new value for my customers. And that might mean breaking historic economic models, it might mean offering new services, it might be offering software, it might be offering other things, but what are we doing? And so I want to give you a couple examples. You all know about the everything that's in a building. There's a lot of stuff in a building. Um, one of our projects, we built out the energy management portal for the Empire State Building. Um, that's a, um, but the Empire State Building on the chiller system, they saved 11%. And, and our portal is in the lobby of the Empire State Building, which shows the energy management gains that were achieved. And so it's part of the, the socialization of the improvement of the space. And it's done through engagement and the portal and energy management and tying it in, so what we're doing is we're taking base optimization data about energy consumption, temperature, et cetera, and we're creating a awareness that leads to lower energy consumption as well as um, a understanding of what, how the Empire State Building has reduced their total energy footprint, which makes people appreciate it from a green standpoint. So, but finding out how to represent that information, that wouldn't have been possible without, without all the data that we got from the optimization front. But we created new value through that. We did gamification for universities um, where the college dorms compete with each other for pizza. Um, so that dorm A versus dorm B versus dorm C versus dorm D, they all have energy management systems in their space. And the winning dorm every month gets a pizza party or the floor. So, what was that? Good, I thought it was the RA, I just turned off the heat. <laughs> there you go. There, there are some things like that, right. <laughs> and so we joke about that, but this is an example of the Long Beach Courthouse. They put performance guarantees in place for their, for their A&E firm because they had the data now they actually did withholds on their contract. They said, we're gonna hold back some of, the some of the, your payments after occupancy based upon the real energy savings that you promised you're going to give us. We're gonna hold back on that until we can document the savings actually occurred. That's interesting. The performance-based infrastructure. Um, and they used, so, so you start thinking about creative ways to th address business problems and create new value for your clients. It's not going to be in the same ways we've done it before. And, and that's going to require smart people. It's going to require different kinds of engagement with our consumers. So I mentioned the Herman Miller st study already. Um, the mobile app the smart furnishings, the occupancy information. So the facility owners are understanding better how many desks they have to have in the space. Um, this is now in place on the trading floor at NASDAQ as well as in some of the new uh, Apple facilities. And they're understanding how many desks they have to have in a given workspace. They're also understanding um, if people are using these expensive sit-stand sit desks. And so um, the HR department is understanding that and then we're also giving people reminders on their phone about when they should get up and move more often so they're having healthier behavior because it's not good to sit all the time it's not good to stand all the time it's the transitions that that promote healthy 
behavior. So you're seeing this really interactive environment. I mentioned Comfy already. Workspace personalization. And people are, are beginning to focus on this. I, I talked to a researcher from Sweden where they were talking about putting sensors in the walls and restructuring wall spaces in the facility. Well, when they start moving wall spaces around, now we've got to play with the HVAC systems. We've got to play with security and access control, but these movable walls, and so now they're putting smart wall technology in place. It's, it's getting really weird. What's the barrier, what's the line now between the technology and the built space? Um, and so we describe it as we have to be able to create multiple concurrent value propositions. We're creating value for the one person who's using the space, using the app, a great experience for them. We're creating management efficiencies for the person who's managing the fleet or the facility. And then we're creating value for us, the manufacturing side or the provider of the building, because you can start sharing insights to say, you know what, to your building owner A, you've got 50 buildings in this government complex that you're managing, and this one building has a wildly variant um, energy footprint from these other 49. Let's think about what we might be able to do to find that. Maybe we can have, we've got one of our customers is actually uh, creating a shared savings model. They said that if we can decrease your, your, your energy costs, we'll take a percentage of that um, and we'll document that. And that's what we're going to charge you on a monthly basis. We're not going to charge you any management fee, but so some creative models are coming into place because it's available bec through the data. Um, we worked on a project with the Minneapolis airport for smart bathrooms. That's an interesting one. So the smart bathroom is a little sign on the Minneapolis airport that says, what's the, what's, how long does this clean last? Where's the closest bathroom if it's closed for cleaning? But the interesting thing is we're using data from the, um, from a combination of weather information, gate disruptions, and um, airport travel information to change the frequency of bathroom cleaning. So if you have a weather delay and the gates are closed and more people are there, you have to clean more frequently. So you change the cleaning behavior in the facility based upon the passenger load going through the terminal. Now, that's all data that's easily accessible. I know when things are cleaned. I know how many people are in the terminal. I can present information and I'm creating more value. Um, the, the funny thing is, the, the CIO of the Minneapolis airport, what he really wants is a cheap toilet paper dispenser sensor. Um, <laughs> he hasn't been able to find one yet. Um, but that's, it's just, it's just interesting to what you begin thinking about from a value creation standpoint. But there are some threats. One of the threats is what I already mentioned, is the life cycle of an app is not the same as the life cycle of the place. As soon as you make this decision to step into the space, we are fundamentally becoming a technology company. You are now shifting from the cadence of the built space and construction and facilities to the cadence of Apple, Google, Microsoft, and Amazon. Welcome to their world. And that means that when Microsoft, if you're running in the Azure Cloud, and this is something that KMC is buffering for you because they're doing the development activity, so that when Apple iOS version 12 comes out and you've got to upgrade a new, update the mobile app, they've got that covered. But that's get, that, that gets complicated. And people need to be able to, to manage that. And this is the uh, citation, the Harvard Business Review article. I'll, I think these presentations are going to be made available, right? I think so. Okay. So you'll get this. Um, yeah, you can read that. Innovators seek to displace rather than support legacy organizations. I never thought about a cannabis automation framework until, <laughs> right? Here to help. Yeah, you're here to help. 
but you're not lo you're not looking to um, work with an install base of agricultural services companies probably you're displacing what they've done robotics automation digital disruption so and <clears throat> So on the OT to IT side, so historically the OT world um, has been built from the bottom up, right? The techs, software, changed through the direct monitoring and control. Um, one of our clients operates uh, petroleum refineries, and their software has to be able to react within a single hertz cycle. It's true real-time control systems. So if there's a disruption to a power cycle before the next, within that one hertz range, they've got to be able to intercept the signal and react to it. Otherwise, something could break in a refinery. Um, so that's real-time control systems. We're not, I don't think most of us are involved in that level of, of aggressive controls. But that's where the OT world has historically been birthed. And there were a lot of islands of data, security through obscurity, right? It, nobody really connected it to the corporate network, and it was purpose-built. But now, all of a sudden, people want data from these things because the data has value. And so we're going to connect them. And so we've got two pressures coming in, traditional industrial facilities, factories, refineries, chillers, trucks, and now we're bringing that into IT. And that forces, the IT people don't know what to do with this either, by the way. Um, they don't understand this world. Um, I was writing down, you know, BACnet. I have never heard of BACnet before. <laughs> I can tell you the people who are here haven't either. Um, so you guys can be the bridge to that, helping to bridge from here to here, if you understand enough here to be able to speak to this. But likewise, the pe I want to let you know the people in IT are also dealing with another pressure from the consumer IoT, from the smart things that are coming into their space. So all of these things that are smart and connected in our IoT, you know, think about in your home, garage door openers, the Nest, your vacuum, your Fitbit, your air purifier, do those talk to each other at home? No, kind of. Uh, if you're a smart things hacker, and right? Uh, it's, yeah, it's, eh. it's eh. Right. Well, guess what? From their perspective, this world is eh. <laughs> and they're dealing with that pressure of people that want to bring these things into their space and their network and then this pressure as well. So how do you communicate to the organizations? How do you make it simpler for them to adopt the thing that you're suggesting? And that would be, in some cases, and IT is used to do, dealing with managed services providers. They're used to that. IT companies are used to that discipline. Um, they are used to the contracting for it, the paying for it on a monthly basis. They're even used to variable contracts, where one month it might be this dollar amount, and the next month it might be that dollar amount. That's how they're spending their Azure spend in the cloud. It's a different consumption model. Facilities procurement people over here, that blows up their brain, right? That blows up their brain. Which means that either you educate your buyer, or you're going to come at it from a different audience in the organization. It might be that you're even dealing with people that are individually wanting to create a better experience here. It might be the HR department. Um, it might be the you know, it, that are trying to create better environments for their workers. Um, it might be a co-working a co space. You know, you don't, so it might be people who are focused on the experience and here who love the idea of having an app to look at their environment it might be an IT buyer, there are more influencers in here than there have been before. And the, um, we get pulled in by um, Microsoft and Amazon will pull us in to work on projects. And 
we, we call these personas, where you understand the different bind behavior here versus the different bind behavior here versus the different bind behavior here. You adjust your message. We actually, part of our recent rebranding, we have OST, which is the technology company. We have a company called Open Digital, which is focused on the digital transformation space because the business users don't like to hear about the technology stuff. So the business people are gonna come in via the open digital side and we'll talk about business and transformation and people and all these warm fuzzy things. But if you actually have to think about your audiences quite differently. It's not a homogeneous group of people and you've got to, and that's part of the digital transformation is having an increasingly sophisticated messaging to your market and coming up with different offerings. The, the offering that, that sold really well here is gonna be different. So, I think I'm talking really fast. I am talking really fast. We're supposed to go to 245, right? It's fine, you're good. No, it's not because that's my last slide. <laughs> <laughs> We have, this is, this is going to turn into a dialogue now. So um, these were six steps that, that, that we came up with for, uh, it's funny, in the last year I've given presentations to people who are in this side of the world and what IoT means, this side of the product engineers who are here, IT people who are here, and um, and facilities managers and uh, HR departments. I gave a presentation to an HR department, it was really wild. And, the, and as a result of that, this is what we said to facilities people and that acknowledge that you might need to become a tech company. That's, that was the first one. We, all companies are becoming tech companies. Um, furniture companies, car companies, did Ford Motor Company think that, I mean, the former CEO of Ford was, was fired like, because they weren't dealing with digital transformation fast enough. And Jim Hackett, the new CEO, is, was responsible for the old one. So companies are making this transition. How do IT and the business work together to connect the islands? It's, that's a necessary discipline that people need to achieve. Offering services to provide value to your customers moving beyond the building. And that's gonna require some creative thought. And it's gonna be a little disruptive. It might be internally disruptive. And this is one of the things, Clay Christensen has written great books on the innovator's dilemma. Um, and what he had highlighted is in, in his book, The Innovator's Dilemma, was how companies that are extremely profitable can lose their place in the market because they're addicted to the profitability of the old way of doing business. Because the old way of doing business was so profitable, because it generated great margins. And Jeff Bezos of, of Amazon is fond of saying that your margin is my opportunity. You know, and that, that mindset is prevalent in the tech community. If there's a place where there's fat margins, um, that's a place where uh, people can drive waste. I've got, I've got one customer in the transportation industry. They looked at their industry and they said there's $113 billion of waste in their industry. And they're figuring out a way to drive some of that cost out of the market and they're gonna monetize it, get transactional. Um, they're gonna get people to pay for things they aren't used to paying for and they're gonna, and they're gonna monetize it. So, so you look at the waste and the margin and we might say, well, we're really profitable and our salespeople don't like selling these services because it's, a, it's not as, you know, we could sell this thing for this much money and he gets all of his commission or he sells the service and it takes like five years to make the same amount of money. You know, they don't want to do that. It's hard. And guess what? It's, it is hard. And that's what Christensen has identified, is that the biggest barrier for profitable companies to adopt the innovative new model is their very profitability, the very thing that made them successful historically. If Apple had said, we are a manufacturer of digital MP3 players with our iPod, and so our new phone is not going to be able to play music, what would have happened? 
um, somebody else would have. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> You're right. Be intentional about both. Yes. Yeah, what's, her, what's a computer? Um, Microsoft is now the sexy computer company. Who would have thunk it with the Surface? Who would have thunk it? Um, by the way, that's an interesting executive study in digital transformation. Bill Gates was a technologist, right? He was a hardcore technologist. He built the company. Steve Ballmer was a sales execution guy. Scalability, profitability, managing the cost. He cut the soul out of the company. The new CEO is focused on user experience and innovation. He's hiring people who are generalists, who can think creatively and do design thinking around what the customers need. It's a very different organizational change. And that gets to the personalization. You know, who advocates for the end user experience and personalization? Who, who, who's thinking about what the customer could experience differently? In your, in your organization. Um, and you can start small. Learn fast. Be willing to try the new thing, even if there's risk of failure. That's a, that's a, it is part of the heart and soul of the technology community is the idea that we fail fast. Um, we try something small, be agile, learn fast, fail fast, and move on to the next iteration. It's only software. It's, um, and so how you iterate and think about that way, it might, you're not a software pure company, but you start having to have that, that mindset. It might be some small experiments that you're going to take, that you're going to start doing. There you go. So you go back to this picture, and the, you know, the experience here is really important, right, of that person who's interacting. But the value you create here might be to the organization through the additional feedback. So what does the data show? Um, and so I think that the, it, it's, we face the same problem because we've historically sold to IT. And now that we're selling to product engineers and to um, the marketing team and you're selling to non-traditional buyers in the organization, we've had to retool our sales force to be able to do that. So we're coming in with a much more consultative sale selling model. Um, and that's, uh, but it's required um, fundamentally shifting the, the selling capability of our team. It's exactly. So here's one of the interesting um, uh, points of view that the tech companies have. A tech company says, I'm gonna gather data. I don't know what value I'm gonna find in it yet. I'm going to start searching. I'm going to start looking for patterns. I'm going to look for things that are weird. And that's how we found some of the value. I mean, we knew that when we started collecting data for Johnson Controls chillers and comparing performance across a global user community that we would learn things. And we didn't know what we were going to learn. But we started to learn things. The Navistar trucks. We, um, here's a great example. We, we learned that Navistar trucks in high altitudes, in cold weather, had a performance problem. And we didn't, I'm, our t our, and, and it was the guys that are looking at the data. And, they, and the, some of the mechanics had said something, and one of the dealers in Montana, they looked at the data, they found that there was this performance variation on one particular engine. They found the thing to fix it in the software. And when those trucks were parked in their fleet and it connected to a secure Wi-Fi, it updated the code on the engines. They didn't have to do anything else. It was a code problem on these Cummins diesel engines that, um, that manifested itself at high altitude, cold temperature environments. We've identified there are certain things that we want to develop at OST that are on our strategy roadmap for the next couple of years. And if we see a customer bend incline, think, ask, even a little tiny bit about that, we hyper-invest in that opportunity. And, and we might not make as much money on it the first time, 
but we create a case study and a pattern and learning, and then we promote that heavily. We promote it to our other customers. We promote it to the manufacturers who have, because if, if Amazon thinks that we can help them do things that they're interested in, they're do, doing for their customers, now I'm leveraging the AWS sales force, the Amazon sales force. And when some company calls Amazon and says, I want to build this thing, then Amazon calls OST, and OST can work with a customer, and that's another path to, to value. So it's, it's, it's a mindset of, of investment in, the, in the customer solutions.